All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Gospel City Church. My name is Nick Gagne. It is a uh, it's it's a wonderful pleasure to to uh, to just worship with you this morning, to um, to celebrate, to sing wonderful songs to our great uh, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Um, I want to invite you all to open up your Bibles to Judges chapter six. And we're going to tackle the entire chapter today, okay? So um, it's not quite as long as Ye Ken's passage from last week. I'm very thankful for that. Um, we're going to have, we're, we're going to see what God has to say to us today. And while you're flipping there, um, let me just, let me just um, spend some time talking about what we're going to discuss. So, um, the issue for the day is how can we obey God? How can we obey God in a world where it seems like it's very difficult to obey God? In a world where it seems like, um, like, like this, the deck is stacked against us in the sense where we have temptation after temptation trying to keep us from obeying God. And so as we approach Judges chapter 6, um, this is the challenge. This is what we're going to discuss, and this is what we're going to uh, see what God has to say to us about this challenge. So I'm going to divide our time into three points in my sermon. Uh, the first point is the call to obedience. Number two is the benefit of obedience. And number three, the power that brings obedience. So call to obedience, benefits of obedience, and the power that brings obedience. So without further ado, let me read the passage for us. We will pray and we'll get started. Uh, Judges chapter six, starting with verse one onwards. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian overpowered Israel. And because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves the dens that are in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. They would encamp against them and they would devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza, and they would leave no sustenance in Israel, and no sheep or docks or, or ox or donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents. They would come up like locusts in number. Both they and their camels could not be counted, so that they laid waste the land as they came in. And Israel was brought very low because of Midian, and the people of Israel cried out for help to the Lord. When the people of Israel cried out to the Lord on account of the Midianites, the Lord sent a prophet to the people of Israel, and he said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I led you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of slavery, and I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. Verse 11. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat upon the terebinth at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash, the, Abir, the Abiezrite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midian. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, Please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has, has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. And the Lord turned to him. And said, 
go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you? <clears throat> and he said to him, please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, but I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. And he said to him, if now I have found favor in your eyes, then show me a sign that it is you who speak with me. Please do not depart from here until I come to you and bring out my present and set it before you. And he said, I will stay till you return. So Gideon went into his house and prepared a young goat and unleavened cakes from an ephah of flour. The meat he put in a basket and the broth he put in a pot and brought them to him under the terebinth and presented them. And the angel of God said to him, take the meat and the unleavened cakes and put them on this rock and pour the broth over them. And he did so. And then the angel of the Lord reached out the tip of the staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened cakes. And the fire sprang up from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened cakes. And the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. Then Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. And Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace be to you. Do not fear, you shall not die. Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord, and he called it, The Lord is Peace. To this day, it still stands at Ophrah, which belongs to the Abia's rites. That night, the Lord said to him, Take your father's bull and the second bull, seven years old, and pull down the altar of Baal that your father has, and cut down the Asherah that is beside it, and build an altar to the Lord your God on the top of the stronghold there, with stones laid in due order. Then take the second bowl and offer it as a burnt offering with the wood of the asher that you shall cut down. So Gideon took 10 men of his servants and did as the Lord told him. And because he was too afraid of his family and the men of the town to do it by day, he did it by night. Verse 28. When the men of the town rose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was broken down and the asher beside it was cut down. And the second bull was offered on the altar that had been built. And they said to one another, who has done this thing? And after they had searched and inquired, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash has done this thing. And then the men of, men of the town said to Joash, bring out your son that he may die. For he has broken down the altar of Baal and cut down the Asherah beside it. But Joash said to all who stood against him, will you contend for Baal? Or will you save him? Whoever contends for him shall be put to death by morning. If he is a God, let him contend for himself, because his altar has been broken down. Therefore, on that day, Gideon was called Jerubbabal. That is to say, let Baal contend against him, because he broke down his altar. Now all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east came together, and they crossed the Jordan, and they encamped in the valley of Jezreel. But the Spirit of the Lord closed clothed Gideon, and he sounded the trumpet, and the Abia's rites were called out to follow him. And he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, and they too were called out to follow him. And they sent messengers to Asher, to Zebulun, to Naphtali, and they went up to meet him. Then Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, behold, I am laying a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece alone and it is dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And it was so. When he rose early next morning and he squeezed the fleece, he wrung enough dew from the fleece to fill a bowl with water. Then Gideon said to God, let not your anger burn against me. Let me speak just once more. Please let me test just once more with the fleece. Please let it be dry on the fleece only and on all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night, and it was dry on the fleece only. And on all the ground, there was dew. This is the word of the Lord. 
Will you pray with me? Father God, you are wonderful. Lord, thank you for the book of Judges. Um, it can sound mysterious at times. It can sound confusing at times. Um, but thank you for it, Lord God. Um, it, is, it is inspired by you. It is authoritative by you. Through it, you are teaching us, Lord God. Lord, I want to pray that you will open up our ears, open up our hearts, and help us to learn what you have to teach us through your inspired word, Lord God. Give me the words to say, not my words, but yours. Um, and may we grow in our love for you. May we grow in our ability to obey you out of love. Lord, we trust you. Thank you. Thank you for hearing our prayers. And thank you again for your word. In your name, Lord Jesus, amen. All right, so my three points for the, for the day to um, just, just to make it clear, the call to obedience, the benefits of obedience, and the power that brings obedience. So as you all know, we in Malaysia are in the midst of a movement control order. And the government in one way or another gave us rules that we need to follow telling us what we can and cannot do as people who live in Malaysia. And to an extent, we trust that these rules are probably for the better, at least most of them. But even when we don't trust that, we trust that if we do not follow them, we will get a summons. We will get... Um, we'll get charged, we'll get, um, we, we will get, be given a ticket if we do not obey. And if you're like me, I, I really don't want to be punished by the government because of these things. So I just stay at home. So I know for sure that I don't break these rules. Well, you would think that in the book of Judges, Israel would just stay at home. And what I mean by that is that they would just learn to obey. You see, Israel was God's chosen people. God came to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, and he told him that his offspring would be blessed with land, with a great populated nation, and that this nation, this people, would be a blessing to the entire world. And because Abraham trusted God, that is, trusted God's promises, he obeyed God. He moved to the promised land. Um, he, he went through circumcision. He, he, um, he sacrificed his son on the altar, or he was prepared to. He obeyed God because of trust. And in the book of Exodus, God rescued the people of Israel from slavery in Egypt, and he made a covenant with them, promise, promising them that he would be faithful to them. And because Israel saw God's work on their behalf and his loyalty to them, his faithfulness to them, they were supposed to trust God and in that trust obey him. We see this in, in Exodus chapter 19, verses 3 through 6, where God tells Moses, who in this passage is, is the representative of Israel to God, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and I brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my command, keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all people for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. If the Israelites trusted God, the call was to obey God. Which brings us to the book of Judges, where we see this constant cycle of bondage that Israel experiences time and time again. We've seen it in, in Othniel. We've seen it in the story of Ehud. We've seen it in the story of Shamgar. We've seen it in the story of Deborah and Barak. 
we've seen this consistent cycle of bondage that Israel just seems to perpetually go through because they do not obey. The first stage of the cycle is the Israelites commit idolatry. Then God sends them into bondage. The Israelites repent. God sends a deliverer, and they experience freedom. And that lasts for a little bit of time before the cycle begins all over again because of Israel's idolatry. And here in Judges 6, Israel's back at it. See, here in chapter 6, Israel was again committing idolatry. And we know this from verse 10, where the prophet recounts God's words to Israel from Deuteronomy, saying, you shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now dwell, but you did not listen to my voice. You did not listen to my voice. You did fear the gods of this land. That is what God is saying here. The Israelites did fear the gods of the people of the land. They believed that Baal was the ruler of this land. That yes, the God that rescued them out of Egypt, their God was strong, but they needed to be on good terms with Baal in order to be successful in the land. Their anxiety and fear of Baal led them to idolatry. And here in chapter 6, God sends the Midianites, true to this cycle, uh, God sends the Midianites to put the Israelites in bondage. The Midianites plunder the land, they steal crops, they steal livestock, and what they could not steal, they destroyed. And you know, this may seem like a shame to us, but remember, Israel was an agrarian culture. Their livelihoods depended on growing crops and having livestock. And they would literally starve to death if the crops and the livestock were destroyed. And this did not just happen for a couple weeks or a couple months. It happened for seven years. And notice the irony here. The pagan gods that Israel anxiously turned to in order to find blessing in this land actually led them to destruction. And while the Christians today, we're, we're about 3,500 years after the time of Judges, um, we are God's people. We are saved by God, just as he saved the Israelites in Exodus. And our call is out of trust to him. We are called to obey. And we find out in Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 39, what exactly it means for us to obey God as God's covenant people. Matthew chapter 20, 22, verses 37 through 39, Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees. And he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. And so the question that we need to ask ourselves today is, do we love God? That is, do we treasure him? Do we, do we trust everything that he's done for us? Are we grateful to him? Do we put our faith in God as priority in our lives? Do we put our ultimate hope in him instead of our wealth, our health, our happiness, or anything else? Now, one way that we can answer this question, and it's probably the best way, is we can pray about it in earnest. We can come before the Father, and we can ask God in prayer to show us where we place our ultimate trust. And if the majority of days we wake up and we work all day, we have dinner, and then we watch TV before going to bed, 
and this is our regular schedule. And, um, we, there's no, there's no uh, regular habits or there's not even a desire to spend time with God. If that is our day, then it might mean that our ultimate hope is not in God. Because the truth of the matter is, the things that we trust in, the people that we trust in, we want to spend time with those people. We want to um, get to know those people more. Because we treasure them. So the first, the first, um, the first command that Jesus gives us is to love the Lord our God. And the second command is to love our neighbor. Not just, not just the people living in our neighborhood or our condo, but all people. And we're called to love them as we love ourselves. And you see, this love is not an emotional love, though that would be pretty good to have. Um, this kind of love that we're talking about is acts of service. Acts of service where we are caring for our neighbors, where we are showing generosity to them during this pandemic where we are uh, checking in on them, where we are sending WhatsApp messages and asking how they're doing and seeing how we can serve them even from a socially distanced manner. How we can pray for them. We show love to our neighbors by sharing the gospel, even if we get an opportunity to through a WhatsApp call or a Zoom chat. Additionally, we can show love by ordering food delivery for them as a demonstration of that love. Or if we know people that are, that are economically suffering during this time of the movement control order, maybe we can um, order groceries from the supermarket for them and have them delivered to their house as an act of love. Now, these are just a couple of examples of what it means to love your neighbor. But there are so many more. And you see, the truth of this, the, the truth of this is that Israel was punished for their disobedience. And the same is true for Christians today. Because if we do not obey God, God will discipline us. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6 says, For the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastises every son whom he receives. And what this means is if we do not obey God out of trust for him, God allows difficult things to enter our lives for the purpose of teaching us obedience. And the purpose of that is to help us grow in trusting him more. And of course, the goal here is not to destroy us, but so that we can grow in Christ's likeness. For both the Old Testament people of God and the Christians today, our call is to obey God. God has worked on our behalf, and we should trust him. And out of that trust, we obey. And so we need to ask ourselves, are we obeying God? And if not, why? That is the call to obedience. So we've got the call to obedience. Let's look at the second point, the benefits of obedience. So Israel had disobeyed God, and as a result, they are put in bondage for seven years. True to the natural cycle that we see in Judges all, all too often, um, they cry out to God for deliverance. God sends a prophet who tells them that their suffering is a result of their disobedience. And the next thing that we see is an angel appears before Gideon. Now, this is kind of an interesting situation. Um, it's kind of funny. Gideon is beating wheat. Okay, beating wheat is part of the wheat refining process during that time. And he was doing it in a wine press. 
a place that you would not normally beat wheat. Now, a wine press was basically a hole in the ground where you pressed grapes into wine. A hole in the ground that was pretty deep. Um, it was, in fact, so deep enough that when someone was in the press, people that were um, outside of the press could not see that person that was in the hole. And so Gideon was literally hiding in a hole in the ground. He was literally in a hole in the ground. He was making his, he was refining wheat, and he was hiding from the Midianites while he was doing this. Literally in a hole in the ground, trying to escape the problems of the world. I think sometimes many of us, we can sympathize with Gideon in that moment. The angel calls out to Gideon, and he says, the Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. And he says this to Gideon, who is, again, hiding in a hole. Um, and the angel calls to Gideon to deliver Israel. Now, this is the third stage of the cycle of bondage that we're so used to seeing. Disobedience, bondage, now deliverance. God raises up a deliverer to save his people from bondage. And at this point, we expect, based on the previous stories of Judges, that Gideon would go straight into battle. He would go straight into battle to deliver the people. But he doesn't do that. In fact, God sends him on a mission first. God tells him to pull down the altar to Baal that is in his family's backyard. Um, to knock it down and to erect an altar to the Lord and to sacrifice to the Lord. And you see, this might seem like a um, kind of an interesting situation to spend so much time of chapter six on, but this is huge. This is huge because the Israelites believed that Baal was the ruler of the land. And they, they believed that Baal was the ruler of the land, and his altars demonstrated that he was the ruler of the land. And so Baal would protect his dominion, and he would protect his altars if he could. So that when God uses Gideon to destroy the altar and to erect an altar to God in that same place, what he's really doing is saying that God is the true ruler of this land, and that God was more powerful than Baal. And so Gideon obeys in verse 27, and did as the Lord commanded him. Now, granted, he does it fearfully at night because he is afraid of the consequences of doing it during the day, but he does, in faith, obey. And Gideon's obedience produces some unexpected results. As the outrage of Baal's altar being destroyed grows, the people learn that Gideon is to blame. They demand that his father turn him over so that they could kill him. Well, Gideon's father, he refuses. And if we're just reading this and um, what we might what we might be thinking about is this was just a loving father who tried to save his son. But what's going on here is so much more. Joash's name means the Lord saves. The Lord saves. Joash was the owner of this fall altar. But he saw that God worked powerfully in Gideon. And, and this act of um, God sending Gideon to tear down the altar and to erect an altar to the Lord, it triggers faith in Joash. Joash goes on the offensive once he realizes this, and he says to all those against him, will you contend for Baal? Will you fight for Baal? Because if Baal was really God, he would not have let his altar be destroyed. If Baal, let Baal kill Gideon, if he really is God. See, 
God used Gideon's faith and um, to trigger in him obedience, to knock down the idol of Baal and to erect an altar to the Lord. And this obedience brings faith to Joash. And this act of faith on Joash's part leads to obedience to um, the greater community because they're okay with this. They, they realize um, that God had done something powerful here. So they rename Gideon Jerubabel, um, which means the judging of Baal. And they trusted that God was more powerful than Baal. And so Gideon's obedience leads to faith in this community, which then leads to more obedience. And more obedience that we'll see in verse 34, when this community marches to battle to fight the Midianites behind Gideon out of their faith in God. See, faith leads to obedience, which then bolsters faith, which then leads to more obedience. And so we see this cycle, not a cycle of bondage, but a cycle of grace, if you will. And just as faith leads to obedience, which leads to more faith, followed by more obedience in Judges 6, the same is true in the New Testament. That is what James is getting at here in the book of James, chapter 2, verse 22, where James discusses the faith of Abraham. You see and I quote here, you see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And to illustrate what James is getting at here, I want you to think of something that probably none of us have had too much experience with over the past year, year and a half, an airplane. The first time you get on an airplane, you're scared, or at least I was. You might be nervous. The plane will crash, or the air will run out of the plane, or um, you will uh, get some sort of bacterial infection because, infection because of the recycled air. But you get on the plane, trusting that somehow, some way, it will get you to your destination. And it may be a timid faith, but it's a, it's, it's a trust nonetheless. You're trusting the plane. And eventually, as time goes by, where you are doing the act of sitting in the plane, you realize that the plane is not so bad after all. You realize that in some ways, you can trust the plane to not crash, to uh, have enough air, so on and so forth. You grow, in a sense, to trust the plane which leads you to the act of being comfortable in the plane. And it might even lead you to the act of flying more often. And you hop into the second flight, trusting the plane more than you did the first time, which leads you to the act of being more comfortable in the plane and more comfortable with the fact that the plane can take you to its destination, which then triggers in you more trust for the plane and so on and so forth. Likewise in James, Abraham's trust led him to obey. Abraham's trust led him to obey, and in his obedience, he saw God's grace at work in him. And so he trusted God more, which led to more obedience. Faith leads to obedience, and then that obedience leads to greater faith. And then that greater faith leads to greater obedience, and the cycle continues over and over and over again. And you see, this is a very powerful tool here. This is something very powerful that God uses in us. Um, it uses us, it uses this to instill faith in other people. Like we saw in Judges chapter six, um, people, people can see the good work that your faith in Christ has led you to. And they, they can believe that and that, and, that, and that obedience can stir in them a faith 
maybe the God that you worship is wonderful. Maybe the God that you worship is real. Another way that this help that this cycle helps us overcome is re- recurring sin. First Corinthians chapter ten verse thirteen says that God will empower you to say no to sin, so that when you are tempted to sin, God will give you strength to fight against this temptation, so that you can stand up for, so that you can stand up under. And when, through his strength, you are able to do the act of resisting sin, you grow in faith. Because you saw how God empowered you to resist sin. And you grow to trust a little more that personal sin really can be defeated. And so when temptation comes against you, you trust more in God's strength because you are confident and you've seen it work in you before. And you trust that God will strengthen you, which means that uh, you feel more confident in obeying the call to resist, which leads you to more trust and so on and so forth. And eventually, over time, you can eradicate at least some of the most obstinate sins through the power of God because of this cycle of grace that is operating in you. Now, this is one of the benefits of obedience to God's people. And this this cycle leads us to greater faith, greater love, and greater hope in God. This is the benefit, or these are the benefits of obedience. So we have the call to obedience. Obedience is based on trust. The the trust leads to obedience and it helps and this obedience helps to grow our trust and lastly my third point we have the challenge of obedience. Now this might sound wonderful. I mean, we read the Bible and um, we can accurately see from our reading the Bible that we are called to obey God. Um, And there's almost even a a, a, a wonderful, just just beautiful component of the benefits of obedience with the cycle of grace. But in reality, it is hard to obey. And we see this in Judges chapter 6. We see that while Gideon was obedient sometimes, like when he tore down the altar, he was afraid to truly obey God. He was afraid that God would make a mistake, that God had made a mistake in calling him. When the angel of the Lord comes to Gideon and calls him a man of valor, Gideon says that that was impossible. You know, I'm just a man here hiding in a hole. I can't be a man of valor. He doubted God's work when he cries out in front of the angel of the Lord. Where was the Lord when all this happened to us? Where was God's mighty deeds? Instead, God has forsaken us. And in verse 36 through 40, Gideon was afraid that God would be unfaithful. Look with me at verses 36 through 40. Um, when this, when um, we see that, that uh, in the early parts of verses 36 through 40, the spirit of the Lord clothes Gideon, and Gideon blows the trumpet, and this army faithfully comes to him. Faithfully comes to him. They are determined to fight the Midianites because they trust in God. And what happens? Well, Gideon procrastinates, and he procrastinates by testing God. He does not just test God one time. He tests God two different times with this woolen fleece. See, Gideon does not test God because he forgot what God promised. 
No, he says to him, if you are to truly deliver the Israelites by my hand, as you have said, he tests God because he doubts God's faithfulness. He is anxious about following God. And we know this. We know this for a couple different reasons. Um, if you take a look at the passage as a whole, before verse 36, Gideon identifies God as the Lord, which is the personal name that God gave to Moses in Exodus 3. But in verses 36 onward, Gideon identifies the Lord as the more generic, less personal term God. The word here, God, could be used for Baal. And it signified that there was a break in the relationship and that Gideon's faith in the Lord was not absolute. The second reason that we see here is by the time verse 36 rolls around, God had promised Gideon that he would deliver Israel through him five different times. Um, he protected him when he tore down the idol by stirring faith in Joash. And yet Gideon was still anxious. And you see, Gideon's faith, or sorry, Gideon's anxiety kept him from being completely obedient. I mean, what would happen if God could not keep Gideon completely safe? What would happen if by completely obeying God, it meant that Gideon, Maybe his life would not turn out the way that he wanted it to turn out. Maybe if he were to obey God completely, he would lose control over his life entirely. These are some of the questions that possibly ran through Gideon's head as he was debating whether or not he could trust God. If he were to obey God completely, would he just lose control of everything? And so Gideon procrastinated. He demonstrated signs. Uh, he, sorry, he demanded signs from God. And he looked for God to lay out all of his plans before Gideon, to lay out every last detail, and to guarantee him above and beyond that Gideon would be safe, that he would be healthy, that he would be wealthy, that he would be successful, that his life would turn out the way that he wanted it to. His anxiety existed because he was afraid that by completely obeying God, it might cost him more than what he bargained for. He was anxious because obeying God meant that he would give up control over his life. And if we're going to be honest, I think we can resonate with that. I mean, we get anxious. We get anxious when an opportunity to obey comes. Um, an example that I find particularly challenging is sharing the gospel with a non-Christian. On one hand, we know we should obey. But on the other hand, we do not know how the other person will react. And maybe when we share the gospel with that person, it will make our lives more difficult and uncomfortable. And like I said, I find this particularly challenging. This is something that I uh, struggle with from time to time. And it does not just happen with sharing the gospel. It happens with sin. I mean, God tells us to obey. But some sins in the moment feel good. Do we really want to lose out on that really good feeling? And we give in. And so we are anxious because in that moment, we do not really trust that obedience to God is worth it. And 
And so the challenge for us, the question that we need to ask is what do we do with this? I mean, our calling is obedience. We've seen that obedience leads to great benefits. But now we have this challenge. Um, obedience is hard. What do we do? Well, the answer to this question lies in Judges chapter 6, verse 16. The angel of the Lord appears to Gideon, and he calls Gideon to obedience. Gideon comes up with excuse after excuse to not obey, and finally in verse 16, the angel of the Lord says, but I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. And this gets Gideon thinking. See, if the angel of the Lord was just any angel, that might be comforting. But you know, another angel could pop up, and maybe that opposing angel is more powerful than the angel that is with you. Things could ultimately go wrong. But the angel of the Lord was not just any angel. The angel did not say, thus says the Lord, I am with you, or the Lord is with you. The angel of the Lord says, I am with you. We see the angel of the Lord showing that he is not just any angel. We see this in places such as Genesis 31, verses 11 through 13, where Jacob encounters the angel of God who tells him that he is the God of Bethel. Or in Exodus 3, when the angel of the Lord appears to Moses and says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and that I will be with you as you go to set the captives free. And we see plenty of more examples in the Old Testament. All this to say, the angel of the Lord is the Lord. The angel of the Lord is the second person of the divine trinity who meets with Gideon and promises him that he would be with him. And this encounter is the catalyst for Gideon destroying the altar. Because when the Lord is present, he acts to empower those he is with in order to accomplish his purposes. And we don't just see this in the Old Testament. We see this manifested in the New Testament when the second person of the Trinity temporarily foregoes the riches of heaven to physically be with his people. I'm talking about the person of Jesus. Jesus preached the good news of salvation. He healed the sick. He rose people from the dead. And he died so that his people could receive the greatest blessing, which is forgiveness of sins, eternal life, and the Holy Spirit, which is God's spirit. His abounding presence dwelling in them for all time. And then Jesus rises from the dead to ascend into heaven as the divine ruler of all the universe. You see, it is this presence of the Holy Spirit that empowers the disciples to go make disciples. It is this presence of the Holy Spirit that empowers the Apostle Paul to experience beatings and sufferings like we would never understand. While being empowered to at the same time, plant churches wherever, wherever he goes and to make known the good news of the gospel in both words and deeds. It is this presence that is available through the power of the person of the Holy Spirit. It empowers God's people to obedience. And we see this throughout the Bible, and we also see it throughout church history. And if we have placed our faith in Christ... This presence is with us. And because of that truth, we can obey. That's what Matthew chapter 28, verse 20 says. So if you are here today and you do not know Jesus, please, Please know that you can have the presence of God dwelling in you, empowering you 
to obedience. All you need to do is trust. Trust that Jesus died for you to give you forgiveness of sins, to give you eternal life, and to give you the Holy Spirit. And Jesus rose to be the divine ruler of all creation. And because of this, you could be empowered to obey God. If you are here today and you are a Christian, please know that you have the very Spirit of God dwelling in you. And you can obey God. It won't always be easy. In fact, it will often be difficult. And there will be times when you are anxious about it. And there will be times where you question, hey, is this obedience to God, is it worth it? But in that moment of doubt, in that moment of anxiety, remember the cross. Remember the cross where the second person of the Trinity died for you so that you could have life, and so that you could be empowered. Remember that Jesus defeated death by rising again from the dead, and he ascended to heaven to be the divine ruler of the universe. Jesus is more powerful than any disease, than any persecutor. He is more powerful than any oppressor or anything else. And remember that the same power that rose Jesus from the dead resides in you. Which means that every hardship you endure is being used by God for your good. To grow your faith. To grow your obedience. And one day, just as Jesus rose from the dead to be glorified, if we trust him, and that trust, um, that true trust Um, is is followed by obedience that is based on that trust, we will likewise be resurrected and we will be glorified as the people of God in the new heavens and new earth. And that, that is how we can obey. That is how we can fight sin and resist temptation. Because God is with us. So, brothers and sisters in Christ, when you are tempted to sin, remember the cross. Remember our glorious future that was guaranteed because of the cross. Trust that God is with you. And trust that he empowers you to avoid sin and to obey him. And from that trust, obey. Will you pray with me? Father God, you are good. Thank you for this time. Thank you for this encouraging word, Lord God. Lord, you are the reason why we obey. You are the ability for us to obey. And you are the the wonderful gift that we have awaiting us. Father God, thank you for these words. Will you let them challenge and impact us? Will you drive us to more and more obedience that is based on trusting you? Because you have done everything for us. That is why we obey. Father God, you are good and your steadfast love endures forever. In your name, Lord Jesus, amen.